do you think uh, government means when they say when Indians are ready to govern themselves? As far as I'm concerned, it simply means that when in, uh, the Indian people become like Indian Affairs, then they can govern themselves. When an Indian Affairs man says when Indians are ready to govern this, uh, themselves, uh, what, what he's actually saying uh, is that this, uh, this will never happen because uh, as far as his mind is concerned, is that that's a, a becoming notion. See, the Indian is in a state of becoming able to govern, and that can never happen because it, it's, not, it's not a, a present state. It's not a being state of the person. It's a becoming state of a person. And when an Indian Affairs man says that, he is more or less telling you that you uh, will never be able to be capable of governing yourself because you're in the, in the becoming state of something or other and not in the being state. It's only when a man comes up to you and says, you can govern, is, does it mean that he's willing to allow you to, to do it. You know, when you talk about <clears throat> programs, projects, uh, all these things, you know, government puts out, and, uh, provincial government, you know, they've got programs devised by people in the provincial government, and the federal government's got the same thing devised by people, you know, there. We have a, a book here, just uh, yeah, a big document written by some professor in the university in British Columbia. Uh, I think that the programs and projects are just a processing system imposed upon the Indian by the white society, just the same as our, the educational system is imposed upon us. And I mean, this, I, I went, I read that book, I went through it. And all the judgments made in there, assumptions, are all by white standards. Yes. They're not by my standards and how I look at life and what life's all about, or at least from an Indian point of view. They think nothing of spending half a million dollars on a deal like this. Why don't they set up an Indian board and spend half a million dollars and let them Indians study their own problem? Even the company Young Canadians, if the government was really serious about what they were doing, They'd make all Indians in Canada volunteers and give them their room and board and their $35 a month and their $1,200 honorarium and uh, the Indians would be free. They'd be getting a guaranteed annual income. For two years they could do nothing but uh, work on stuff like this or wander around or do anything they wanted and government would be happy because they'd have 210,000 volunteers. So everybody would be happy. And I made this suggestion and uh, it didn't, it didn't sink in. They <laughs> After the war, the government allotted out a quarter section of land to each Indian, and they got $2,300. And today, uh, well, and they went farming. Two years after some of them guys got their land broke up, you know, broke it up, but they also wore out their machinery. No more money, so there were failures. And uh, you can't tell me that them fellows are a hundred percent failures because they failed on this government scheme. Where could you get a recommendation? Uh, you know, it, it's no good depending on government officials to, to, to back you up on a loan or to give you any kind of recommendations because They've made you a failure by their own stupid programs before you even start. Well, if an Indian shoots, you know, uh, on crown land, anywhere, shoots a deer or a moose for, you know, feed it to feed his family, well, then the provincial law comes into effect which does not allow him to transport that. Although his treaty, under the treaty, he has the right to shoot it. So if he shoots that 25 miles away from his home, home then he has to bring his family to them and cook it right there, because he can't move it. Otherwise, he breaks the provincial law, and they jail him for that. You know, so the whole thing really is a farce. Well, that gives you a good example of the kind of uh, politicians that we have in this country. You know, they're, they're all talk, but when it comes down to business, yeah. to do something or other, continually we get the runaround all the time. Yeah.
<coughs> and it's interesting you know, we get to run around you know uh, at every level whether it's at the superintendent's level or municipal level provincial level federal level and it's a damn shame when we have to always go to the supreme court of canada before our rights are recognized you know I think one of the troubles that uh, is the cause of all this is that the treaties and the Indian Act have been kept in the dark. We speak about them in hushed voices, especially the white people and government people. Oh, they say we mustn't violate their treaty rights, and they go around it. Oh, they don't want to violate. To, uh, to counteract this, I think one of the things that we should work for is to have the, the treaties and the Indian Act included in a revised social studies course and made and have it uh, made compulsory for all schools, provincial and federal. In this way, the younger generation will grow up understanding what this is about. You take a lot of the treaties to a lawyer and he'll say, well, under the law of Canada, there are certain things that are called unconscionable. It means that that nobody in their right mind would make an agreement like that. So they call it an unconscionable agreement. And then that agreement is, is void, and they would have to come and make new treaties with the Indians. Well, for a bottle of rum, the Indians gave away whole chunks of land. In a court of law, that would not hold up, because that is an unconscionable arrangement. Nobody in their right mind gives away land for a bottle of rum. Well, I'm telling you, if it was, if I was a chief when they made the treaties, we'd have them fellows in the reserve instead of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You would create a white act. Yeah, <laughs> the white act. The white act. Yeah. One of the uh, important things that was being hinted at is the fact that the great majority of the Indian people don't know what the Indian Act is or what it means or how it applies to them. And I think if somehow this act could be explained to them as it is, what it means and how it restricts them, I think a lot of the arguments that you have wouldn't be there because they'd understand. Yeah, but the big thing uh, is suspicion on losing their land, their reserve. The only thing that stands to, to keep them, if they could get a guarantee that this land will be theirs forever, then they're not afraid of being assimilated into the white population because they will always have this little island of refuge mm -hmm. that will maintain or represent something Indian, always. Well, uh, a few years ago, we had 35 farmers on our reserve. Now there's only four. And the white man is farming the rest, the rest of the land while the Indians get, collect uh, sometimes less than a third, sometimes a fourth of, of the cash returns from this green. I'm telling you, a white man is a fast operator. And if, I'm just taking a, a, a thinking of a quarter section of land I got. Supposing I start borrowing a little bit, it was handy to borrow. Before I know it, he'd have it. They did this in the United States where there was a reserve 90 by 40. And they lent the Indians on the strength of the land money to improve their land. And out of that uh, 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 360 sections of land, I think today there's only four Indian farmers left on that great big reserve. You know where the rest of them are? They're in a little mud shack village built up that, uh, that the church gave them land to live on and they're squatting there while the mortgage companies seized all these other farms to pay for the machinery and the improvements they had. This is the kind of thing that I don't want to see in Canada happen. A major problem is an economic one. And here again, we need uh, political reform, which means government reform. We need that. 
if we're ever going to attain economic independence, we have to have it. You would propose what in this case? I've always wondered why all these organizations that are dedicated to the uh, advancement of Indian people, why they don't pull together and try and persuade governments to change these things in the Indian Act that prevent the Indian people from becoming economically independent. If you're going to think that you're going to put 250,000 Indians or registered Indians under one organization, this is impossible. But I think you can get a national organization that will be workable politically across the nation. And at the same time, I think Mrs. Lavalle brought up a very pertinent point that if the Indians want an organization that is effective and that'll work for their interests, they are going to have to start learning now and recognizing the fact that that organization can become independent and effective only when they themselves support it. And the organization has to depend very little on outside sources for its continuing thing. There's going to be a lot of development amongst the people to get them before you can get them in a position. If I was going to depend on the Indians for my salary with the Federation, I don't think I'd last a couple of weeks. What would be the type of thing that you would talk about in order to interest people to unite them? I mean, we can't talk about... Uh, uh, fighting for our country, you know, they've taken it away from us, we're dispossessed people in our own land. Uh, what causes? I mean, what's our cause? I would think uh, the major unifying factor of Indians across the country is their common dislike for Indian affairs. We, we have to raise our hopes, uh, we have to aspire to something better. This is what gives us the incentive to live We can't just be stagnant and keep on the one place. Now, even though we aspire to these things, we're still Indian. I'll always be an Indian and I'll always be proud of it. And this is what I have tried to instill in my kids, that they're Indian. They'll always be Indian, no matter if they reach the, the highest pinnacle of education. They'll always be Indian and be proud of that. What happens is that we are caught in a real uh, bind because on the one hand, I would like to say, yes, Indians should go out and fight for what, what we, we need, but in order to fight, we have to fight using white men's methods. The minute we use white men's methods, we have become a little bit like the white men and less like the Indian. When I got out of high school, I didn't care about the Indians. I didn't care as long as I got a job. You know, I, my education was so that all I wanted was to improve myself, really. And I never really learned the dignity of the Indian as a person. And I didn't really know that. Um, well, I never had really any sense of confidence in myself as an Indian. Maybe I did as a person, but not as an Indian. And after talking to people who, had, who were interested in Indians, that's the only way I was able to get interested, too. Because before I was, well, I wasn't interested at all. We got some qualified teachers. Are they qualified? I said no. Because when I said a qualified teachers to teach our Indian nation, they don't talk Cree like we. They sure they're qualified with a white man education. This is the theory of what we have, most of us, this northern country just because we don't have a chance for a teacher to explain our lessons in Cree than repeat in English. This is the failure we, we have. The whole communication within the uh, structure of the Indian language is, is such that a child who speaks Indian at, at three or four years old is in total communication with the oldest guy on the reserve because they all speak the same language. 
or as opposed to white society, where in what you learn in grade two and three, you can't even begin to communicate with people who are in seven and eight because they change the words, the same meaning, but they change the words, and so on up, you know, into high school and into university, and. Uh, you know, they're, talk, they're talking about the same thing, but they just use a different word. And so that, that, you know, breaks the whole communication system, you know, within white society. Now, I've seen a community development officer specialist talk for two and a half hours to nine chiefs. And after I spoke to those nine chiefs, five of them didn't know what the, he was talking about at all. And the other five of four had four different versions of this Grants to Bands program. You see, Indian Affairs and the Indians, there's a definite gap between Indian Affairs level of programming. They'd never come to meet the Indian in his own thoughts and in, in his own ideas. And every, it's a, it's a natural instinct for a white man to show off how good he can talk English, especially if he's got a, a degree or something, you know. If there is two or three of them with degrees there, they'll try to outdo one another in big words, you know. And if they're talking to a group of Indians, it's not the Indians they're talking to, but they're competing with one another to see who could put over the biggest words. And to, to solve any kind of problem, it takes them three or four days to figure out something that we can figure out by intuitively knowing uh, without even a discussion, in most cases. At least I find this amongst the Indian people. I don't think the Indian using his own methods is integrating or assimilating into the white man's society because the white man never had this until he came over to the Americas. And I think yeah, the, the, didn't have any democratic form. What he had when he came over, he came over to the Americas because he was ru running away from oppression, not because he was leaving uh, milk and honey behind. And the Indian offered him uh, this type of democratic system. And I think what I'm saying is that we, uh, this should be explored more deeply. <coughs> and to try and come up with a better system than the majority rule system that the society has because that's a compromise they made out of their own history with ours that they could never be, they could never operate by consensus. When Columbus discovered America, he didn't create America and he didn't, he didn't build America, it was there. And, and he, he came and, and, and other white people came and they took America. Well, that became part of their culture, and they called themselves Americans. Well, it's the same with a car, you see? Like, we discovered the car, the same as we discovered the horse, or we discovered fire. Like, we didn't create fire, and we didn't create the horse, and we didn't create the car. But it's as much a part of our culture as, as uh, the things that people talk about, like moccasins and canoes and so on. I think that uh, uh, a lot of times the white man would have us believe that we're losing our culture. We're not losing our culture. We're developing it, and it's alive, and it's dynamic. And even if, uh, if we don't even speak Indian, or if we don't even powwow or anything else, if we decide that none of those things suit our needs anymore, that now our needs are, are met with uh, rocket ships or something, we'll still be Indians and we'll still be expressing ourselves and we'll be culturally Indian. I think it's totally unrecognizable by people who have degrees who are white people and say that there's no recreation within Indian communities. They come along and say, well, so they try to, to organize some type of uh, recreation. But as far as the Indians are concerned, there's all kinds of recreation in that community. When they talk about it, about it in Indian, you know, and if you go and carry on a conversation in the Indian language about recreation, they'll say, well, sure, if a guy is sitting under the tree over there, and he's looking up at the clouds, you know, he's getting a form of recreation and education at the same time because of what he's observing and feeling, and that is part of the recreational system that exists within the Indian community. 
I went through some Indian <laughs> communities, you know. And uh, some of these people live in real contentment. You know, where you never see it in uh, in the white community. I had a fellow traveling with me that was a real high-pressure salesman, a competition fellow, you know. And he said, I could feel that feeling of no competition. He says, and it scares me. And I said, why would it scare you? I said, that these people are contented. I said, if you're not satisfied with getting up in the morning and selling a farm before dinner and making $2,500 for the day, you count the day as a failure, is that right? Oh, yeah, it's a bad day, he said. It makes me wonder, is this fellow, he can't sleep at night and he's up and he's working himself to death and maybe he's contented that way, but for me, I think in the Indian people at large, I don't think there's any of them built that way. You talk to any Indian, I'll tell you, sure, I'd like to live in a $50,000 home. And then you, you carry the conversation further and you say, well, are you willing to spend 50 years of your life working eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, week in, week out, month in, month out, to buy that house? And he says, 50 years, that house costs too much. I would like to have it, but I'm not gonna, it costs too much for my freedom to buy it. And the truth is that Indians aren't willing to sacrifice the amount of freedom of, of their own development as human personalities for materialistic kinds of things the way the white man is. The white man is a man who looks at a table and, and he sees it not as a functional object. He sees it as, as uh, money. <coughs> As part of himself, he when he buys a table, it's to tell his friends what kind of a guy he is, what good taste he's got. He puts all kinds of abstract sorts of value in a table. Indian will buy the same table, but the value he puts on it is whether or not it holds a cup and a plate and a knife and fork. If the table's leg gets broken, the value of the table is no more because it isn't functioning as a table. But with the white man, the older a table gets and the less functional it becomes, the more valuable it becomes. They call it an antique. I think, you know, the Indian fails to look into what is happening in, within white society. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're so taken up all the time about, uh, you know, the only way to deal with white society is become like them, uh, fight uh, on their value, their standards, and this is what we got to do. You know, that's bullshit. Yeah. I'll tell you right now, because when they got all of us working out there in the doggone fields and doing labor chores, you know what the white man will be doing? They'll all be on a guaranteed annual wage. And right now that's coming about. It's starting to happen right here in Canada. I think the Indian, you know, uh, is best prepared of all the peoples in North America to cope with a technological society because it's not much different than the society he once lived in. Nature once gave him everything that, and he consumed from nature. Today, technology gives you everything you consume from the, from the technological advantages. We, the white man is redefining what work is. He's saying that work can be doing anything. You know, he, he says that the only proper work for a human being is, is uh, the work of the mind. The only proper work for his hands is the creative arts, painting and sculpture and things like that. And the only proper work for his body is sports. This is what the white man, guys like McLuhan, are saying today. And that's the way the Indian lived 200 years ago. But I don't think that people who are at the bottom of the rock and who want a better life or a more secure life for their families can afford to do this. What good does it do to give a guy a, a job to be a welder unless he's going to weld sculpture? Because there is no other place for a welder to work. Technology does the job better than a man can do. You know, maybe we should get in to talk about, you know, really what the hell are we all about? And, and what about organizations? And, you know, and, and what is it that we, what's so good about white society? Because eventually we're going to have to move into that society. You know, and we should really begin to ask ourselves, why haven't we done this? Today, I'm using my natural insurance 
burden a white man in Sun. Life in Sun. You understand me what I meant, natural life in Sun. And a white man in Sun. I don't think we understand too clearly. Or at least I guess. Now I'm going to explain this. Now, supposing them, all them white people, they are Indians. In my young days, when I was 16 years of age, I started to hunt. I gave that white man 15, 20 pounds of moose meat or a coat. The same with that white man, the same with that person. Maybe I'll give him five dollars. When he's stuck, the same with that, that fellow. Maybe I'll give him my pillow or something like that. It runs to about 40, 50 years. Now I'm a man about 72. I get the revenue, what I give 50 years ago. Hmm. That's what I call <laughs> natural life <laughs> insurance. Beautifully said. <laughs> we are a great people. We're a race of people. And as a race and as a spiritual people, we have lots to give the white man. The white man is not a spiritual person. He's uh, an academic person, he's a person who relies on his ability to use his academic nature, his mentality, but not his spiritual nature. And because of that, the white man is on the verge of annihilating himself. He has atomic nuclear weapons that he knows that he can press a button and wipe out himself completely. He is a man who is dead already, dead before he even dies. That is where the white man is. We, as a people, can give those people something. We can give them back uh, their spiritual nature and give them back life and give them back the eternal beings that we are. And I think that we have so much to give and we have a responsibility to give this because if we don't, those people are going to destroy themselves and maybe us along with them.